Thank you very much, Eduardo. It's a great pleasure to, to be here in this very distinguished gathering. Um, I'm going to do something rather different uh, from what we had previously. Um, less evidently international, but none the implications are nonetheless global. Um, so, too many things going on in these slides. The, the idea behind this paper came from watching developments following the, the financial crisis issues, uh, the questions about what is a fair amount of tax, these concerns about uh, whether we should be bringing sales in as a, a method of collecting tax. Um, but of course, one of the things which is striking about that is that we already have a tax on, on sales in the form of VAT, which is in fact a uh, tax on consumption, which is collected by businesses, though it has the, the special feature of offering a credit for VAT on own purchases. And it, this is a, an important contrast to digital turnover taxes which have been proposed, which are on turnover, on gross revenues, and uh, there is a danger if they become too general that they in produce an element of cascading, an, an element of tax on tax, uh, if they affect transactions between businesses. And indeed, it's that element of cascading from a general turnover tax <coughs> which was the, the cause of the invention of VAT as a concept. But the other thing that, that struck me, apart from this fact that we were sort of approaching the question of taxing sales from both sides, is that the discussions about this and the discussions about alternative taxes, in particular in the US, the, the sudden fad which arose and then departed again for the idea of a destination-based cash flow tax, these are all being discussed as corporate taxes, even though in many ways they look rather like VAT, which we discuss as a tax on consumption. So my thought was, being naturally of a, a contrary mind, if we can talk about um, corporate taxes as being something like a tax on consumption, do we also have to worry about the, the contrary side of that, that VAT is a tax on consumption, might also be a tax on corporations, and can we get some insight from that? And in particular, I, I have worried for a long time about a particular problem in a an obscure little line of European Court of Justice cases on, on VAT and holding companies, which you would think is a fairly rarefied problem and one that could be relatively easily solved. But the way the ECJ has approached it seems generally bizarre. And the question is, is it bizarre and does it offer any insights? That's the first question. And the second question is, what can we do with those insights? So a little bit of background about VAT, because I suspect there are one or two people here who are not entirely familiar with it. Um, VAT is charged on <coughs> supplies of goods and services made for consideration, so there's got to be a counterpayment, and this is the European Union definition. Other definitions are available, uh, but they're surprisingly not very much different. Um, by a taxable person, that is someone who's carrying on an economic activity, and finally, we need to have a territoriality <coughs> condition that it's taking place within the country. So these are the transactions which are subject to VAT. Now, one important element of this story is the concept of economic activity, which is very broadly defined. Any activity of producers, traders, or persons supplying services, uh, including mining activity and professional activities, together with the exploitation of tangible or intangible property for the purpose of obtaining income therefrom on a continuing basis. <coughs> so these are key elements in the definition. And what do we get out of those elements? Well, we get out of that a, a tax which is imposed on all supplies of those who are economically active. So everyone who is economically active, who is a taxable person, charges VAT on all their supplies of goods or services, whoever they are supplied to. 
But when they receive goods and services, when they purchase goods and services, they pay VAT on them, but they get a credit for that VAT. So they're only paying to the government the net amount of VAT. The amount of VAT they've charged to their customers less the amount of VAT they've paid to their suppliers. And that is, in a sense, paying VAT on the amount of value they've added to the, th the things they purchased, hence value-added tax. Now, the advantages of this structure of tax are, first of all, that it gives neutrality. So this mechanism of getting credit for input tax gives neutrality in a number of senses. It, it frees it from distortion, but it also gives businesses a sense of neutrality that they don't care whether they charge tax to other businesses because they know the business will get credit, and they don't care whether they're charged tax or not because if they are charged tax, they'll get a credit. Um, and it's also defined, this neutrality is defined in the EU legislation, the VAT directive, in reference to the tax being proportional to the price, whatever the number of transactions in the, the productive process. So another element of the neutrality is that it doesn't distort the productive process. If you have a turnover tax, that encourages vertical integration to limit the number of transactions that take place. VAT doesn't distort this. So it has a number of good properties. And another interesting property is that it is a general tax on consumption. So we're taxing all these activities of business, but because we're relieving business of the immediate impact, the incidence <coughs> falls on consumption. So it ends up being <coughs> a tax on consumption. So we started with a tax on value added and we've ended up with a tax on consumption. And the, the VAT directive in the EU presumes that it's a tax on consumption, uh, provided it's sufficiently general and provided we don't put some little tweaks into it, we're reasonably certain that it will end up being a tax on consumption. Um, but we need to have these general uh, features of universality and the, and the single rate to be sure of that because we don't actually have all those features. We have reduced rates, we have zero rates, and we have exemptions, including the rather important exemptions for financial transactions and real property. So it's not a perfect tax by any means, but, but underlying it is a, an idea of perfection. And indeed, one of the things that makes VAT unique is that I believe it's the only tax where the theory came first. So it was devised in, in the 1920s simultaneously in, in Germany and the US and it was developed um, the ground for it was developed in, in France and, and the US. Uh, the first one to actually be enacted was enacted in Japan at the behest of uh, American economists though it never actually came into force. So the first one that actually came into force was in 1954 in France, and since then it has spread to every continent and has become perhaps the, the most popular tax in the world, at least from a tax administrator's point of view, not perhaps from a taxpayer's point of view. <laughs> but these, these limitations are quite significant. Um, so there's an average gap between rates of about 10 percentage points, uh, but the, the sort of exemptions that it's easy to, uh, to exercise discretion about account for another 6.5 percentage points. But these, the fixed exemptions, the structural ones to do with the treatment of financial services and, and real property in particular, create another 28 <coughs> percentage points of gap. So we've got a large policy gap in, in moving away from VAT as a, a general tax. Excuse me, that's UK data or...? Um, I, I'm actually not sure which data it is. I think it's UK data. Because you have this large financial sector, so it's a bit distorted in the UK. It, it's often it's less elsewhere. Yeah. So it looks like the UK figures. Yeah. So what do we need to make VAT? How do we get from taxing value added to taxing consumption? It turns out that there are two features that we need. There are two sets of determining factors how we treat international transactions and how we treat investment. So in order for this to be a tax on uh, consumption, we need to tax on a destination basis, that is we tax imports and we exempt, exempt imports because that's, we want to tax consumption within the country, so imports are being consumed in the country, exports are being consumed elsewhere. But we also need to give a full credit for capital expenditure. 
we need to give a full and immediate deduction for capital expenditure in the year that it's incurred. And that's essentially because spending in the economy is either on consumption or it's on investment goods, and we need to exclude them entirely by giving a full credit. Now, that's in contrast to the way in which we, we tax income, where we give a credit for depreciation on capital expenditure. So we only give a deduction as the, the expenditure is, is used up in producing value for the producing profits for the, the businesses. Now, the exemption on financial services covers a number of points. The granting and negotiation of credit, which covers interest. Transactions concerning payments and transfers. And con transactions including negotiation in shares, interest in companies and associations, debentures and other securities, which would seem to cover the sale of shares. Might also cover dividends, but that's a bit less clear. So that leads me into these little holding company cases. The first one comes from 1991. Polisar Netherlands is an intermediate holding company owned by a Canadian company. This is the oil industry, has a number of subsidiaries in Europe. These subsidiaries pay Polisar dividends and uh, it pays dividends to its ultimate parent. There's actually another intermediate holding company in there, which doesn't really enter into the story. But in running its pretty minimal operations, it's not doing much other than receiving dividends and, and paying them out again. It still has some structure, so it incurs certain costs. And it has to pay VAT on those costs. And the question is, can it get a credit for that VAT? And the court looks at this situation and says, well, the problem is it's not carrying on any economic activity. All it's doing is holding shares. And <coughs> you may recall that the, the definition of economic activity includes the exploitation of intangible property for the purpose of obtaining income therefrom. But they say merely holding shares is not exploiting Shares are intangible property, but merely holding them is not exploiting them. So you can exploit a piece of land by renting it out, and you'll earn rents from that, and that's economic activity. You're doing something with the land. But you don't have to do anything to get dividends from shares. You just have to own them. The dividends come from the nature of the assets, so you're not exploiting the shares. You're just owning them. It's just, it's just an investment activity. So they say, no, Polisar is no different from a, a private investor it's um, receiving amounts of income, but it doesn't have any economic activity, so it's out of luck. And that, that doesn't really seem right. I mean, why, why is it that this holding company shouldn't be able to get a VAT deduction on its costs? And interestingly, this, this case was interpreted in, in different ways in different countries. Uh, the Netherlands. Uh, took a liberal view and managed to figure out ways to give uh, holding companies their deduction, and the UK took a very strict view and said, this clearly says holding companies don't get a, a deduction. Um, so it didn't exactly clarify the story. Then we come two years later to the Sofitan case, and this is another holding company which is receiving dividends. However, it is engaged in some other serv service provision for which it gets fees, exactly what is is not very clear from the case. So the court says, well, this is a company which is engaged in economic activity because it's doing something else. Can it get a deduction? Well, the problem is dividends are not the consideration for supplying any services. It's not doing anything to get it. It's just holding the shares. <coughs> so can it get a deduction? Well, one way in which you determine how much of a deduction you can get when there are exempt activities going on is by looking at your partial exemption ratio. So you determine how much of your input tax is going to be creditable by taking the proportion of your outputs, which uh, entitle you to a credit, which are taxable, in relation to your total <coughs> output. <coughs> So they said, yes, you can do that, and, uh, but you don't have to include 
dividends in this figure because they're not turnover, they're not inputs or outputs. So you can ignore the dividends in calculating the proportion that's deductible. So presumably, Suffertown gets to deduct its costs because it's got some activity going on. Now, that's rather confusing, but there was a general statement that the, 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 um, the court made about these cases. It said that you can only, that a, a, a holding company is not carrying on economic activity, but the situation might be different <coughs> if it was involved in managing its subsidiaries. So Polisar is a passive holding company, it's just sitting there. And the impression is that Sofitam is as well. But then we get to a different case, Floridien and, and Berginvest. Um, Berginvest is, is so Floridien is the main holding company, Berginvest is a sub-holding company, so they're basically in the same position and there are various other subsidiaries below both of them. So let's focus on Floridien. It's receiving dividends. However, it's providing management services of various sorts, including things like accounting and all sorts of back office services, to its subsidiaries. So the court said, aha, now we have a situation of a holding company which is involved in managing its subsidiaries. And th but they say the important aspect of it is not what the French government suggests, that you look for whether the, the holding company has substantial influence over its subsidiaries. <coughs> no, the key element is that it's receiving a fee for services. And the reason this is important is because of the nature of, of VAT. Because of the economic activity has to be activity for reward. Why is that necessary? Because VAT is charged on the amount of consideration for supplies of goods and services. So if there's no consideration, there's no amount to charge VAT on. So there's a closer link between economic activity and consideration. And there's also the advantage that using fees as the test, services for fees, provides a nice objective way of figuring this out. The French test of, of su uh, sufficient influence involved you know, looking at things, all sorts of rather subjective factors that were not going to be very easy to apply. So they say in, in this case, um, because of that, they can in principle get a deduction for various costs, um, but you've got to figure out, uh, but the, the dividends are still not uh, consideration for anything, and they give a number of reasons why they're not consideration for anything, uh, apart from the fact that it's not exploitation. Uh, it's clearly not consideration for managing because uh, a controlling shareholder gets the same amount in dividends per share as any other shareholder. And in addition, the amount of dividends is not fixed. It's not clearly consideration for doing anything. It's a share of profits which are, are variable, and then it doesn't seem that we can describe this as consideration for anything. So they make a fairly clear case that, that dividends are not consideration for anything. There isn't a supply being made to the subsidiary in, in supplying shares. Now, we might say that uh, someone subscribing for shares is supplying capital to the company invested in. So it's not self-evident that there isn't a supply going on. But essentially, they say, because there's no exploitation and because there's, there's no, cons the, the dividends can't count as consideration, we don't have anything. Now, in SIBO participations, we have <coughs> something similar, uh, but in this case, they want to get a deduction, a credit, for the cost of acquiring the subsidiaries. So they're receiving dividends, and they're also supplying management fees for services, but they want to get uh, a deduction for the cost of acquiring their subsidiaries. And that looks as though it comes within the exemption of transactions in relation to shares. So it looks as though this ought to be exempt, which should deny you the opportunity to get a deduction. <coughs> but the actual determination so comes from the... Um, partial exemption ratio, and what outputs are there that might match up to this exemption? Well, the only 
receipts that would cover outputs would be the dividends, but we've established they're not consideration for anything. They're not consideration for the acquisition of the subsidiaries. So we leave them out of account, and we say, well, is there a, some other way we can get entitlement to the cost of acquisition of the subsidiaries? Well, they pick up a doctrine that they developed in a couple of other financial cases that's saying, well, when you have some expense that doesn't seem to, that looks as though it might be attributable to something exempt, but we want to give it uh, an exemption anyway, we can say, well, if there's no actual exempt supply that stops it, that it's assigned to, we can say that it's linked to the, the business as a whole, to the overheads. It's really part of the overheads. And therefore, we can get round the apparent exemption that's involved and say, well, it's deductible according to the general partial exemption ratio. Uh, what are the outputs of CBO participations? Well, management services, which are all taxable, so it looks as though it's back to getting a 100% deduction, even though it doesn't seem that's where it ought to be going. <coughs> well, the way in which they got to this construction of, of giving deductions for overheads is, is a, another story. But what's interesting here is in terms of what happens for holding companies. Because, uh, I said at the beginning, it's not obvious why we would want to exclude holding companies. Well, there seems to be a distinction which they're making, which comes out of a number of other cases, between vehicles that look as though they're managing private investments and managing holding companies which are part of the enterprise. And you can imagine that at the top of a structure, you might want to distinguish <coughs> between a holding company that is part of the group structure and a holding company which is merely a vehicle for holding the top level shares, which is more in the nature of a collective investment vehicle than in the, the nature of an active holding company. So you might want to find some way of distinguishing that. And what is, what is puzzling out of, out of this case is the, the criterion that they've come up with. Um, I will skip over a few things in the interest of time. The criterion that they've come up with doesn't seem to be a very good one for identifying managing. But on the other hand, this test of fees, because you can easily imagine a managing holding company that was exercising influence without receiving any fees, although arguably transfer pricing rules might encourage it to receive fees. And equally, you can I imagine an investment company, a pure investment company, that tries to get a VAT credit by doing something nominal for a fee. Presumably, anti-abuse provisions could manage to, to get round the latter problem. And arguably, the problem of the burden that is potentially imposed upon and the distortion of, of group structures that potentially comes from denying VAT credits to holding companies might be seen as something more serious. So what these cases demonstrate is that, that something as innocuous as VAT could in fact, depending on, on how it's imposed, have a significant effect on decisions about corporate structure, which could have no significant international ramifications. <coughs> there are, of course, other ways in which that can happen through VAT. This is sort of one nice little story which uh, seemed not to make sense. And the interesting thing about it is the cases that seem more understandable, the beginning ones, seem to give a result that doesn't make sense. The cases that seem to involve <coughs> more extravagant interpretation of the, the VAT legislation in the later ones seem, despite theory, to have got to the right position, which is, uh, shows something about the, the, the absolute brilliance of the European Court of Justice and their <laughs> methods of, of reasoning. But let me take it, if I can, to the other side. Two minutes, yes, okay. Um, I'll get to ten slides in two minutes. So, uh, we can think of consumption as being sales minus costs, we can, but we, that's equivalent to value added, which is wages plus profits. So, the value added is the difference between the sales and costs, but that is attributable to the contributions, essentially, of wages and profits, which is to say, labor and capital. So we have a certain symmetry here. Um, and indeed, one of the things that's interesting to think about, we're used to analyzing the incidence of corporate tax in terms of capital and labor. 
and the modern discussion doesn't talk anymore about any uh, impact on consumers. Now, there's some discussion about whether uh, corporate income tax can be passed forward onto prices, but it seems to me the, the real analysis is saying, well, we only need to consider capital and labor because consumption will be by the owners of capital and labor. <coughs> Therefore, if we look at the incidence on consumption, well, that's really coming back to an incidence on capital and labor. And this is the division which makes sense, particularly since corporate income tax is designed to look like a tax on capital. But we can turn it around and consider the other side of the economy. So there's no reason why we couldn't get back to looking at the incidence on consumption if we move away from capital and labor and do a, a look at the, the dichotomy on this side of the economy between consumption and investment. And, and that picks up the fact that, that um, you know, we can define value added in these two ways. And indeed, Alan Tate came up with four possible ways of taxing um, value added. So we're used to the VAT method where we figure out the tax on outputs, we subtract the tax on inputs, and that gives us our standard invoice credit VAT. <coughs> but we could also do it from the accounts, calculate the total value of outputs minus inputs, and put tax on that, which has been tried in a couple of American states. It was proposed in Canada at one point. However, if we can calculate it in this way, we could look at the other side of the accounts and say, well, outputs minus inputs really is wages and profits. So we could simply tax the total of wages and profits. And if we can do that directly, then we can also do it directly, indirectly, as we did with VAT, and have a tax on profits plus a tax on wages, which demonstrates that a VAT could look very much like something that looks like a corporate tax plus a wage tax, an employment tax. Of course, in order to... In in order to get there, we have to use a consistent definition of profits. And the definition of profits in, in standard corporate income tax is this accrual-based definition, which has a deduction for depreciation, also essentially <coughs> has an origin basis. So in order for uh, this to be similar, we would have to move to a full ex expensing cash flow basis with a... Um, ideally a destination basis, which is essentially the destination-based cash flow tax, uh, which the House Republicans picked up in 2019, though it goes back to uh, a paper from Arbach, Devereux, and Miller from 2010, and indeed has earlier roots um, from some work that um, Steve Bond and Mike Devereux did. So this offers a cash flow uh, basis with an immediate deduction for capital investment. It offers a a destination basis. The, the one thing that was very controversial about it was that it has a deduction for the cost of domestic wages, but if you have a, a tax on wages to match it, then we're essentially back into the same position. So this suggests that we can have a, a move from uh, our VAT to a, a VAT on value added to a cash flow tax on wages plus profits and a similar movement from a corporation tax. So, but the question that I'm left with is you know, whether this is really how it works in the end. Because a lot of these discussions are based on the idea of general taxes. And we know that these taxes have imperfections. So you know, corporate income tax has a deduction for depreciation, but it's not for real de depreciation. It's often for accelerated depreciation. There are all sorts of other imperfections in the, in the process, we know that, that VAT has the, the imperfection regarding the exemption for financial services, um, which is necessary, which is sort of an incomplete exemption because it, it, it actually taxes the banks, <coughs> which is necessary because they're providing uh, value-added financial services to consumers, so we need to pick them up somehow. So there are all these imperfections, and the question is, at the end of the day, have we, are we actually taxing, do, do we know what we're actually taxing, and is it possible that we can get more insight into the, the incidence of taxes we're imposing on companies by considering the impact of VAT-type taxes and using these methods of, of equivalence to 
try and gain alternative types of insight into tax incidents. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, I was interested to hear uh, uh, Ian's, Ian's, Ian's presentation. I didn't unfortunately receive his paper until minutes before I came here. Uh, but uh, I was aware of the general thrust of his arguments. Uh, now, I, I entirely endorsed what Ian was saying about the popularity of VAT. Uh, it is now probably <coughs> one of the most <coughs> popular taxes in the world, and it spread very rapidly. Uh, and um, unlike uh, Edward's remark about the fact that fiscal innovation often follows wars and things, this is one that, that, that arose in largely in the post-war period. Um, I, I, I take issue with a number of the things that Ian has been mentioning. Um, uh, now I speak as a former official, and I was listening to what Ian was saying uh, and trying to consider whether uh, any of his arguments would, would, would command a huge amount of weight in terms of policy development. Uh, in VAT, you've already got a very robust uh, and resilient and buoyant tax. Uh, and I would have thought that any kind of movement towards uh, suggesting that um, uh, VAT be considered as a corporate tax uh, would need to be looked at very critically. Uh, the reason for that is VAT is a consumption tax. Uh, and the tax <coughs> wording of the legislation and the way it's operated makes it very clear. Uh, that it's expected to be to be borne by the final consumer. In reality, the statutory burden for the tax is actually imposed on, 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 on the companies that actually add value in the production of their goods and services. <coughs> uh, and the final intermediation in terms of who actually bears the burden of the tax is actually determined by the impact of uh, market conditions. Uh, Companies which actually face a very, very inelastic demand curve uh, have a high degree of probability of being able to, 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 to pass on the entirety of the tax uh, to, to the ultimate customer, whereas if they face a very elastic demand curve, uh, the likelihood is that the company itself would be left holding the baby of the tax. In practice, what happens is very large corporations, uh, because of the power they can command in the market and, and, and the power of branding, they can usually manage to pass on the entirety of the tax. Uh, in 2016, in the wake of the financial crisis, uh, sometime after the financial crisis, Nigel Lawson, a very eminent former chancellor of the Exchequer and a very, 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 very iconoclastic thinker in fiscal matters, uh, suggested in the context of the, 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 the crisis on taxing digital companies that corporation tax was broken and that what you really needed was a sales tax uh, that, that could take the place of corporation tax. Uh, and the reaction it produced was very simple, which was that corporation tax is a direct tax, uh, whereas, whereas uh, VAT, like excise duties, are an indirect tax. Uh, and the thought of actually extending VAT to, to, to become a, f a corporate tax would involve a number of considerations which I would have thought uh, any official advising ministers would, would have to caution ministers against, against venturing down that route. A key one of that is that, of course, Corporate taxes actually cover a full range of income. Uh, and uh, you know there are a lot of things included in the computation of corporate profits which would not come within the scope of a value-added tax. Rents, interest, uh, speculative trading gains, uh, and possibly a host of other activities which couldn't conceivably be described as coming within the scope of a consumption tax or a tax on sales. Uh, the other flip side of the coin is that companies tend to be owned by wealthier individuals. And any move towards <coughs> relieving the liability on corporations of paying a direct tax on their profits would have the effect of actually shifting the burden that's correctly borne by companies or the people who ultimately own them onto consumers or the generality of all, all taxpayers. Uh, another very important impact would be that any announcement that you were moving away from taxing companies directly uh, would actually substantially increase the capital value of these companies, which again would predominantly benefit wealthier taxpayers. Uh, what, what this really boils down to is that uh, what you have are two different taxes. Now, I wasn't aware of the, the, the case law that Ian, Ian has, has very helpfully brought to the fore here. Uh, but one thing I would say is that it appears to be a very specialized stream of cases. Uh, and that it might be, to say the least, a bit premature to, to generalize from that 
to saying that this marked the general trend towards VAT becoming corporate tax. Uh, and I, for one, would be very cautious about suggesting that as a policy objective. Uh, and <coughs> I would suggest that what you really need to do is try and see uh, whether there are more effective mechanisms uh, for taxing corporations directly, uh, rather than, than trying to overburden a tax which is already facing its own problems. Uh, because, you know, VAT was introduced as the tax for the European Union and then spread to other countries. The creation of the European single market uh, and the, the, the developments in the digital world and e-commerce and in particular the, the, the forthcoming uh, diffusion of uh, 3D, 3D, 3, 3D printing and uh, the Internet of Things could actually make VAT more difficult to implement in the future with, you know, because the capacity that firms would have for dividing up the jurisdiction in which various aspects of the decisions you target on take place. Uh, well, I would, I would very strongly argue that uh, we, VAT is already a corporate tax in the sense that uh, firms that face an elastic supply curve already end up with holding the baby for the tax. Uh, people, small companies in particular, uh, which choose not to, which which choose not to register because of threshold, uh, relatively high threshold, also end up holding the baby because they can't de deduct their input tax. Can only pass on that liability uh, if they manage to include it in their prices. Uh, in terms of corporate taxes, I would still argue, uh, taking a very conventional economic view, that this is really something that can only be passed on in terms of firms actually reducing the real wages they pay their staff, which is something we've seen signs of happening in the recent past. I think there's less evidence of firms passing on the bill for corporate tax liability to consumers. Uh, but I think this is something that, 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 that there might have been research on which I'm unaware of. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, thank you, everybody, for having me here. Uh, well, I also got the paper this morning. I had a chance to briefly go through it, but don't expect too much in-depth insight. It's more uh, ad hoc thinking of what came to the top of my mind. Um, first comment I would like to make is that uh, the paper raises two interesting questions, I think. Um, I'm not so sure whether they are really so intimately connected, though. So to me, it almost seems like, like it's two papers in one. Um, because uh, the question you put to the fore in your think first, the second slide, Ian, was really, what can we learn from, from VT, from a statutory or real economic instance of VT, maybe for the corporate sphere, especially now that we're discussing uh, moving the allocation of taxing rights closer to the market? And that is a, a super interesting question, I think, that, that certainly merits uh, some, some thought and where we might indeed draw some interesting conclusions. And on the other hand, if you look at your paper, um, the question that you find there in introduction, that the key question according to, to the paper is, um, there are certain imperfections in the VT in that it is not a really uh, a pure tax on consumption, but it can also be a, a tax on, on corporations or corporate profits and so forth, and you then specify that, giving the example of um, exempt financial services and especially holding companies. And I, I think these are really two different things in a way. I, I get the idea that I think in the first part you want to show, okay, maybe VAT and corporate income tax are even closer currently than we think in practice. In theory, they are apart in that uh, VAT will not capture the, the normal return on, on investment whereas uh, a corporate income tax should, but in reality, uh, you know, VAT might be impure, and so it's even closer to a corporate income tax than, uh, than, uh, than we think. And while that is a valid point, I don't think um, to make that point it would be necessary to go into all the details of the case law. I think that is interesting in itself, but it's a, it's a different analysis, I would mm. think. Uh, having said that, um, coming to the first part also of the presentation, which dealt with those, uh, with those line of case law, I think that was a uh, very interesting analysis. It was Delegate Artis. Uh, you uh, really showed this puzzling result, and that's what I liked about this first part of the paper, that um, the court comes to the right conclusion, as we would uh, expect uh, them to be, based on the fundamental principles of VT, uh, but using a very bizarre reasoning based on technicalities that we find in the European Directive. And that is ind indeed an interesting result, and it's, it's kind of telling, I think, of what of often happens with the Court of Justice. Um, after having come up with a first judgment, getting a lot of criticism, it will not retreat and come up immediately with the right solution, but it will try to twist its case law 
uh, and then some decades later we, we might end up in uh, 90 percent of the cases with the right solution um, some technical comments just two three and then I go on to the second part um, one thing I wonder about is um, does it really make sense, I think this is maybe something you could still explore a bit further, to treat private <coughs> investors differently from a management holding structure um, if we think about the fundamental principles of BT. So is private investment really consumption that should be burdened or costs incurred for uh, managing your private investment folio? Should that be burdened with BT? Uh, to my knowledge, that that's a bit disputed amongst economists, but mainstream economists would say no, it should not. It's not uh, a consumption activity, it depends a little bit on how you define consumption, but I think that's something worth exploring, whereas in the paper it's just stated as a fact we should be able to distinguish here, and I'm wondering whether we really should. Um, assuming that we should, um, I think the paper could maybe still benefit from finding some inspiration in a, in a comparative legal analysis, so for example the Swiss do what you find a bit questionable in your paper, and that is they come up with just a fixed participation threshold, if it's more than 10% you get the input VAT deduction even though the holding is not um, carrying out any tax output supplies, or uh, we have the Australian New Zealand modern systems where anything that is a business but not private consumption will get will qualify for input VAT deduction. So I think that would be interesting um, strands of, of legal developments that, that might enrich uh, your paper. And, and finally, you mentioned the need to come up with anti-avoidance um, a criteria based on the generous case law of the court, and here I just would like to point out that in the Marla decision of the court, quite recent decision, we find a first hint at that in that the court uh, requires a permanent involvement in the management of the subsidiary to grant an input VT uh, credit. Now, um, coming to the second part, which I find even more interesting, so what can we learn from VT statutory uh, and real incidents for um, now the current discussion on moving uh, taxing rights uh, for direct taxes closer to, to the market? Um, what I really like ab about the paper is that it, it very um, um, clearly shows um, the, uh, the, the equivalence in terms of economic um, well, incidents between a, a VAT and um, a, a corporate income tax to the extent that it is a cash flow uh, based, and uh, at least in the closed economy, and that's something I will, I will talk about in one or two minutes and also um, very clearly shows, and this is something I think that's new and that's really interesting, that we can for that purpose, for that exercise, more or less ignore the fact that when you introduce a VAT, it also um, falls on previously accumulated um, savings, uh, which are then taxed when, when spent for consumption, and you, you really show nicely that for our analysis we can ignore this. Um, now when it comes to, to your final conclusion that yes, we can learn a lot from from VET incidents for the reason of those equivalences, um, for corporate income incidents, um, I'm a bit skeptical, mainly due to the fact that we don't know so much about VET incidents either. And um, one of the things that is highly disputed, of course, is how much of, <coughs> of the incidents is really on consumption and how much is, is on, the, um, well, on the supplier, actually. And it depends on market conditions, as we've just heard. And the problem is, if it's on the supplier, we still don't know. No one had re has really asked in the, in the field of VET whether you know on the supplier side is actually borne by the shareholders or it's actually borne um, by by the labor uh, factor so we have the same issue as whereas in corporate income tax just no one no one asks about it in, in the field of VAT because it's just another step uh, behind what we would normally think about uh, where normally we're just concerned between how much is on consumption how much is on the supplier but the supplier is also again capital and labor and so I, I'm skeptical whether we have enough you know insights into, into real economic incidents of VAT when it comes to capital and labor, uh, that we can draw conclusions from that for the corporate income tax side. But what could be more interesting, I think, is, is the international dimension. This is also what, what we're now interested in. And here, I think, it could be an interesting observation or something, something, might be might something worth exploring, that um, in, in theory, um, the corporate income tax has, has a broader base because it also captures um, the returns, uh, the normal returns on capital. But in reality, uh, in, in the system that we have now, uh, with the tax planning opportunities it offers, a VAT might actually have the broader base, uh, because currently you, you don't capture the normal nor the extra normal uh, rates uh, to return uh, under a, a corporate income tax, uh, because uh, everything is, is kind of shifted to, uh, to tax havens. Whereas um, the consumer is less mobile, so the VAT being attached to where consumption is, uh, gets to effectively tax more, and this might be something uh, interesting to look at. So, what's the incidence really here, and and does that justify maybe maybe m the theoretical con concepts or such as the uh, BBCFT or 
um, sales apportionment factors um, that we are currently discussing. Um, another issue is, it, which is again theoretically um, discussed, proven, but empirical insights might be interesting uh, to, to substantiate that, that one criticism leveled against the C DBCFT is that it stops effectively taxing the non-resident um, investor. Uh, so uh, the incidence of the tax due to the, due to the border tax adjustments and due to the fact that this uh, will or is expected to lead in the middle term at least to um, real exchange rate adjustments, um, the incidence of the tax only falls on local uh, labor and um, extra normal returns and no longer on the returns earned by non-resident um, investors, whereas that is different um, under the current corporate income tax uh, to the extent that it is actually taxed at source, and source is still more or less the market, because then you get to tax also the profits earned by non-resident investors in the market. Now, in the current screwed system, that's not for sure, because a lot has shifted to tax havens, but if we make it more robust in the way that it actually sources closer to where the market is, and this is about the current, um, the current uh, efforts at the OECD level and elsewhere, um, this might be something to, to explore also empirically, uh, if, if possible uh, and interesting and your, your work could, could be a basis for that. Um, can, we, can we really hope to uh, have a more robust system here um, or are we not maybe um, giving away um, taxation of, of non-residents here? Um, yeah, well, basically, I think that were all my points. Um, thanks a lot. So given how um, late in the day we received the paper, or early in the morning we received the paper, I don't have any proper comments on it, so my comments are pretty left field generally. So I agreed to take on this paper because I really like the title. And the title was around, Is VAT a Tax on Businesses? Now, from a selfish perspective, I needed to answer that question myself because I shoehorned in two weeks of VAT into my business tax course. So I was looking for a strong justification. <laughs> okay. Now, if, if it is a tax on businesses, then fine, right? We don't have issues around salience and compliance. But I, I had a couple of thoughts. If it is actually a tax on business, or sorry, if it's a tax on consumers. If VAT is a tax on consumers, how do we justify the fact that the collection of that tax is outsourced from the state to private actors? Okay, um, and so we see that in the case of VAT, and we also see that in the case of PAYE in respect of income tax, and in respect of national insurance in the UK. Okay, so we've outsourced all that, and I remember a, a senior HMRC official once mentioning that most tax is actually collected without HMRC lifting a finger. Okay. And so we can actually broaden that inquiry out, I think, and we see actually a lot of this in the UK as it stands, the outsourcing of state responsibilities over to private actors. So those of us that are working in universities in the UK will be acutely <coughs> aware of the fact that we need to take roles on our, st oh sorry, we need to take roles to see what students are in our classes. And that obligation is imposed upon us, not by our own institution, but rather by the Home Office who have threatened to restrict or even remove our right to grant visas to non-EU students if we fail to give them information about <coughs> student <coughs> attendance. So we might ask, on what, on what principle or on what principles do we see this outsourcing of state responsibilities? And also, if we go even further with that, and we think about the relationship between the citizen and the state, if citizens don't even realise that they're being taxed and all of the tax is going to the state without them even realising. This brings up issues of salience. Okay, issues of salience. So if I'm not engaged as an ordinary individual, as an ordinary citizen, in the process of taxation, then what does that do for my relationship between, well, the relationship between me as a citizen and the state? But if it's a tax on business, then all of those issues fall away. So against that background, the consideration of VAT as a business tax by Ian Roxanne is filled with, I think, important contributions in respect of VAT. A critique and rationalization of close to incomprehensible case law, along with findings about the nature of the impact of VAT. So on page nine of the paper, for instance, which proceeds a discussion of the ECJ's treatment of holding companies in respect of the receipt of dividends, 
Roxanne explains that the real problem that the ECJ faced in the later holding company cases was that the scheme of the VAT directive is to exempt financial services and so also returns on financial services in principle including dividends and interest but at least for domestic holding companies. The court felt that they should not be disadvantaged so long as they had some taxable activity to which VAT credit could be attributed. And that seemed to me as well, when I was trying to read the paper, I couldn't understand the reasoning in the cases. And it's only against that background that it re they really start to make sense. And so if I were writing the paper, I would put that actually f at the forefront of section two, saying this is what's going on, underpinning the reasoning in these cases. Because otherwise the reasoning of the ECJ looks like the court is dancing on the head of a pin, trying to make distinctions between situations that are I don't think easy to distinguish. Okay, but even if that is accepted, and there's still some of the analysis of the ECJ is difficult to understand. So for instance, part of the reason that I struggle with is the distinction between equity and debt, which apparently the ECJ thinks can be sustained in the analysis. That loan finance, which is interest bearing, does involve economic activity because finance is supplied in the expectation of interest. But the receipt of dividends apparently represents the return on investment in a company and are merely the result of ownership of that property. So even then, not all, <coughs> was, okay, so even then, right, not all interest-bearing loans actually do go on to generate interest. Whilst investment, on the other hand, we know, can take the form of preference shares, where dividends are supposed to be guaranteed. So how do you distinguish those two situations? I'm not entirely clear. Okay, but then Roxanne helps us with this by pointing out on pages 9 and 10 that VAT is best understood not just as a tax on consumption but also a tax on value added and in the case of dividends there is no cost incurred in adding value. So to that end stylistically I'd also put that fundamental point at the beginning of section 2. Now if Ian were concerned about submitting this eventual publication for the REF and for those of you in the audience that don't understand what I'm talking about this is the government initiative by way of which we're required to over egg the importance of our own work. <laughs> so I put it as follows, point by point. VAT is a tax on value added and consumption, beautiful, which is supposed to be neutral, okay? But it's <coughs> not neutral because it contains exemptions. Now the fact that there are these exemptions has an impact on the intelligibility of the case law. And I'll concede here to you that they, you've made a cogent argument as to, on the basis of neutrality, as to why we should treat holding companies as part of the whole enterprise. Okay, as a single unit. And if ultimately the enterprise does, does not make exempt supplies, then any holding company in the group should be able to credit its input VAT. And this would mean avoiding the problem of extending VAT neutrality to purely private investors. Okay, so, but the presence then of these exemptions has the consequence that it is actually a tax on consumption because companies cannot supply exempt supplies uh, uh, companies that supply exempt supplies cannot deduct their input VAT, which they must ultimately seek to recover. It could be passed on to the consumers in the form of higher prices, <coughs> but it could also be borne by shareholders or workers. And once we realize this, we see the similarities with the debate on corporation tax. So then you point out to the economists, take note of that. And then once we acknowledge the cogency of your argument on the treatment of the group as a single unit, we're reminded of the proposition that corporations should be taxed on the profit of the unit, unitary taxation. So unitary taxation proponents could take note. So those are just my brief comments on the basis of a quick reading of the paper in a coffee shop this morning. Two minutes. Sam, I, I think this understood my position. I'm not advocating that VAT should become a corporate tax. I'm more discussing the, the risk of it becoming a corporate tax. So it's not, it's not my suggestion that it should yeah. become it. Uh, as <coughs> the place of the corporate tax, when there, the point is that, that some of the proposals for replacing corporate tax, like the DBCFT, in fact, look a lot like VAT. And that's, that's the point there, that, that it's more one of um, not that VAT should be a corporate tax, but by looking at the elements of it that are like a corporate tax, it may actually help us not only understand VAT, but understand the corporate tax. So it's, it's, it's not so much a, a proposal moving in that direction, but trying to understand 
uh, the implications of it. Um, Joachim, thank you for very helpful comments. I mean, I, I agree that it's really two papers. Um, the trouble is they're both interesting. <laughs> 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 um, but, but I agree that they're, they're very different. Um, one, you know, you pick up this point about the, the impact uh, that is the VAT or consumption tax is going to have on existing capital which is sort of a counter-argument to Sam's point about uh, switching to, to VAT, relieving the owners of capital, because there is actually an argument that there's <coughs> a burden on the existing yeah. owners of capital. So um, one of the things that comes out of it when you start to get into this, the, the details become incredibly complex. Um, as picking up Stephen's point, um, uh, the complexities of understanding the, the exemption for financial services are profound, um, uh, understanding what it's actually doing. And uh, now I had sudden insight going back to the, the Mead report and finally understand why people advocate zero rating for financial services and then realize why that doesn't work because of the financial services to consumers, which is back into the place we started at. So you know, a lot of these problems are, are quite <coughs> profound. Um, and I think... Um, Joachim's point about the international aspects are, are, are very well founded. Um, the problem is getting to a good analysis of those involves sorting out some of the other things. And, and, and part of what I was, was saying was, uh, well, if we have this uh, allocation between capital and labor and talking about corporate tax, we could also bring back consumption into the incidence question by looking at an allocation between consumption and investment. And um, Joachim suggests, yes, that we get back into capital labor issues. But the point is that they ought to be identical to consumption investment. The problem is because we haven't looked at it, we haven't figured out what that actually means. And, and you know, we, we have figured out ways of saying, how can we dissect consumption into returns to labor and capital? But we haven't done the reverse. And I think the reason uh, an incidence analysis based on, on consumption doesn't sound very uh, <coughs> profound is because we haven't figured out what the other side is, which is investment, and, and how that looks in how that looks as a, a decomposition of labor and, 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 and capital into those, rather than doing the decomposition <coughs> in the other direction. So this is you know, partly a, um, an outline of, of further work <coughs> to try and sort of hopefully provide new insights into the corporate tax. Thank you very much indeed for that.